here I am. It's really me. This is the voice of Carl King, and I really do sound like this. If you want to support this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash carlking. Once you're there, you can subscribe and pledge $1 a month or $5 a month, and it helps make this podcast, as well as my other creative projects, less impossible. As always, thank you to my endorsement logos, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball, and Toontrack for their continued help in, quote, making the making of complicated music less complicated. Wow. Today, I have another previously unreleased Lost episode for you, rescued from March 2014. It's with Greg Bissonette, who might best be known for his work on David Lee Roth's Eat Him and Smile record with Steve Vai and Billy Sheehan. But as three or four lucky people know, I have always preferred the album Skyscraper. I actually have it framed above my desk, so I didn't waste much time in making that almost 30-year-old record the topic of this interview. Also, this is my first mini-episode I'm releasing. It's only about 15 minutes long, as I caught Greg in the hallway of a hotel before he went in to start his drum camp. Apologies that this is the lowest quality episode I've released so far, because it was all recorded on a handheld Zoom recorder with built-in stereo mic passed back and forth between us. There's only so much I could do to improve the quality, so if it bothers you, just don't listen to it. In fact, give up on listening to all podcasts released by everyone. However, I do hope to release more mini-episodes in the future, minus all the popping and booming. Okay, time for me to shut up. Here he is, Greg Bissonette from three and a half years ago. Sitting on the floor, Indian style, actually, in the hallway of a hotel with Greg Bissonette. Carl, thanks for having me. We're at our Groove Camp. This is my second annual Groove Camp in Thousand Oaks, California, and we've got drummers from all over the place. Last year, our furthest traveled camper, Carl, was from Edinburgh, Scotland, a woman, and this year might be St. Louis area, Missouri, one of the guys, but it's just an honor to be able to, to give a Groove Camp on groove drumming and, and how, to, how to play and make people feel good and dance, and it's not just about drum solos, but it's about really getting into the groove in different styles. I want to ask you some specifics on that, but the first question I want to ask you is uh, someone told me that you can learn a lot about someone from what they have to say about their high school days. Yeah. So what would you have to say about that? Well, uh, I agree. My high school days, uh, my favorite band ever is the Beatles, but my second favorite band is, is Chicago, Danny Serafin and the band Chicago. And my, I had a band with my brother, and we had the same instrumentation in Chicago, trumpet, trombone, sax, keyboards, guitar, bass, percussion, and we played 90% Chicago tunes, and then we also played Beatles and Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and a lot of dance tunes, too, but we'd play for our high school dances, and my favorite kind of music, Carl, is pop music, pop rock especially, like the Beatles, the Stones, Led Zeppelin, Hendrix, the Foo Fighters, the Eagles, Maroon 5. I just love good pop music, especially pop rock, and so that band... It's interesting you'd say that. That band kind of carved out what I knew I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I get to play with my favorite drummer, Ringo, now for the last 10 years, 11 years. And what a great honor. We're going out again this summer. We're playing the Santa Barbara Bowl and the Greek Theater. We'll be on a six-week tour. Such a blast. On the topic of the, of your groove, uh, where do you think your sense of precision timing came from? Because you're capable of being so crisp and clean. Um, has that been an area of focus, either to perfect it or even to work on not being so perfect? Or Both, both for sure, Carl. I don't think I'm, I'm really all that precise. I have to work at being precise. If I'm going to do anything, it's speed up. So I've always had to work on not speeding up. And uh, nowadays, you know, everything's recorded on click track with Pro Tools, and you have to play with a click and nail the click. So I work constantly um, trying to get my groove as good as it can be, but... We're all human. We all have our own heartbeats and our own emotions of things we're going through on any given day, how much caffeine you've had. You know, all that stuff relates. So groove is definitely subjective. I have a question about um, being a drummer in a music career. Um, maybe to me it seems like there's kind of like two music industries, one that's like made up of musicians, musicians, and then one that's more like about the entertainment pop side. And... I was looking through your discography and stuff. I noticed you play with a lot of really great musicians. 
but maybe not current pop names. And I wonder if that's a conscious choice or does it take other great musicians like Steve Lukather and all these guys to recognize a great musician? Do you, are you guys drawn towards each other to work together? Or I think it's probably mostly the latter. I'm so busy playing with guys that are great musicians that you can only do so much work. I mean, I'd love, I would absolutely love to play with Bruno Mars or Eminem or Katy Perry or uh, Drake or um, Maroon 5. Um, there's so many bands that I love that are current. Um, but for some reason, maybe part of the reason is a lot of those have machines. But the other part of it is that um, I, I don't really work right now with producers that produce those groups. But I am working currently with a lady that's amazing. And she's going to be the next huge phenomenon in the pop world. Her name is Alex G. And I'm working with a great producer named Michael Blue. And Michael kind of discovered and produced Colby Calais. So even though you don't know Alex G yet, I think you're going to soon. Cool. Um, so now I'm going to pop on to some, uh, a certain era of your career that has always fascinated me that I've never been able to get much information about. Okay. So I'm very curious to ask you a series of questions about Skyscraper. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, could you tell me just a little bit about where that record was made? Yeah, that was cut at Capitol Studio B in Hollywood. And uh, we rehearsed for that record in, in David Lee Roth's uh, amazing um, home yeah. in, in his basement. He has a studio, big, huge rehearsal studio there. And we rehearsed for it there, wrote the tunes, came up with everything there, and then recorded it at Capitol Studio B. And then it was overdubbed on at different places. Uh, Smoke Tree up in um, Chatsworth. Uh, Conway, I think it was mixed mostly at Conway in Hollywood, but kind of all around L.A., but recorded my drums at Capital B. I'm, I'm very curious to, um, to understand the sort of dynamic. I'm suspecting, this is my suspicion, I want to find out if this is true, if sort of Steve Vai was sort of like the band leader for that group. Well, he produced that album with Dave. Steve wrote most of the songs, although we all had songs on there, but he wrote most of them. And he really knew how to make albums, you know. And Dave really knew how to make bands, you know, sound good. So the, the two of them produced it. I think, it's, I think it's listed as David Lee Roth and Steve I producing it. So, yeah, I mean, Dave always has great ideas about songs and parts and solos and everything. And Dave, and Dave and Steve worked probably as the two main guys. And Billy Sheehan and I and Brett Tuggle, we all had our opinions too, but you can't have everybody giving their opinion at all times, sometimes with the producer and a co-producer or whatever. So you got to have a hierarchy, and that's we were all real happy with that. I don't know when this when you answered this question on, a, on YouTube, but there was a question about your audition for David Lee Roth. And there was a part in there where it sounded like Steve Vai was auditioning you for the band. Yeah, you know, it wasn't um, advertised as a David Lee Roth audition. Vinnie Vincent from Kiss had told me, you should, tr you should audition for Dave Roth. And I said, Dave Roth? He said, David Lee Roth. I said, he's in Van Halen. No, he just left. He's got a new band with Billy Sheehan. He got first. And then Steve Vai. So the two of them were, were told by Dave, go out and find me a drummer. But it was advertised because uh, Steve had his own band. Steve I looking for drummer. It wasn't a lie, but it wasn't for Steve's band. It was for Dave's band. Okay. So kind of doing it under the radar? Under the radar. But it was a big, long line outside of SIR in Hollywood. I was like, oh, my gosh, a lot of drummers here. So you actually thought you were auditioning for Steve Vai? I knew what I was auditioning for, but a lot of the other guys didn't. Yeah, luckily Steve Smith recommended me to Billy Sheehan. Vinnie Vincent recommended me to Steve Vai. And Kenny Richards from Autograph was a running buddy of Dave's, and they would run every morning, and he told Dave about me, so he kind of hit him from all angles. I hear a lot of interesting background vocals on that record. Um, any clues as to who were doing a lot of the backgrounds? Mostly Brett Tuggle, who's like the number one MVP for every tour. He's with Fleetwood Mac now. He was with Jimmy Page, with David Coverdale, Chris Isaac. He can do anything. He, he plays great keyboards and synthesizers and sampled stuff. But he also is a really good rhythm guitar guy and a killer singer. And so he sang most of those backgrounds. Billy Sheehan and I did too, but mostly the backgrounds are Brett. 
Was there anything, any moment on the record where you could say, yeah, that was me singing that? Yeah, I sang, um, I sang a little bit on every song, I think. Maybe the one that I stick out the most in in my own mind is Two Fools a Minute, I think, yeah. The recording process between Edom and Smile and Skyscraper, were they drastically different? Drastically. Well, not drastically. I mean, they were, they were all done to tape which albums aren't done anymore. They were all done in great studios. They were all done by rehearsing and compiling and writing in Dave's basement and then going to great studios to do them. But Ted Templeman with the engineer Jeff Hendrickson was one approach and one team. And Steve I and Dave with um, engineers like uh, Doug Perry, Magic Marino, it was a little different, you know, in that way. This interesting sort of Eat em and Smile demo got spread around on YouTube. I don't know if you've heard that, but it sounded like you guys basically, the original tracks from the album, like the same almost mix and everything, the same parts, but it had your stick count-ins and things like that. But then it had really rough scratch Dave vocals over it. Oh, okay. I was wondering. Well, that, I don't know. I've never heard that, but I could tell you what that is. Then somebody from one of those studios leaked that out. Because if I had my count off in there, those were the tracks. Um, and Dave, as every singer does, you know, does different takes, a lot of different takes. And so those takes are now on YouTube. Okay, I want to hear them. I'm sure they're great. Do you, do you do that stuff to a click? No. Back then, things weren't cut with a click. You just kind of play. I got a tempo from a click. It was called a... Dr. Beat. I got tempos from that, and then I just kind of winged it from there, and I would take it and count to 10 off and then just play. Wow, so the whole skyscraper, there's no click. It's it's all you uh, leading sky, that? Skyscraper, believe it or not, is uh, different. I should I should clarify, because I'm the more I'm thinking about it. You, you were talking to Edom and Smile. Skyscraper, I had a little earbud, and I would check in with that Dr. Beat more, because uh, that was just me cutting all the drums by myself, nobody else. I just went in, I had my little charts, and I just played them all at Capitol, and then everybody overdubbed on it. That's amazing because those drums are so precise. And Thank you. Well, we rehearsed a lot, and we, knew, we all knew our parts. Dave really knows how to train the band, you know. Um, he's like a great leader, and then there was no guesswork on that, on those tracks, you know. There was, there was a guesswork when you got in the studio and you'd try new things, but overall I knew what the songs were because we were prepared. That band was prepared, man. We didn't mess around. It was great players, great singer, great leader. And we had our stuff together, man. Not a lot of bands could just go in and cut the drum tracks and know that everybody else's parts would work, but we were well rehearsed. How did you do the trick where the tape speeds up? Yeah, that's Steve Vai saying, I'm going to slow down the tape. You play this. Do it again, speed it up, slow it down on the tape. Do it again, these. Do it again, and it went from. That's all Steve, you know, and his great Zappa esque kind of style. But, I mean, it was all the same tempo. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, those were overdub toms. I'd hear the track going, and I'd go. Uh, I see. Printed the click. We might have printed the click. Yeah. Okay, on to your your new album, which I bought on uh, iTunes, and I've been checking it out, and I'm amazed with. I think the title track has this super aggressive drumming, uh, really short cymbal yes, that's sounds. A, that's a Zildjian trash hat stack. So if I did my math right, you're in your mid fifties. Is it four, five four, like five four time, fifty four. And so how do you do it? Oh, man. I look at Ringo, who's 74, coming up here um, in July, and I go, that guy is in better shape than anybody I know. He has ripped abs. He exercises like crazy. He eats amazingly healthy, and he's a happy, peaceful guy. You know, he's my role model. And I'm 20 years younger, and I'm in worse shape, and I'm a nervous wreck half the time. You want to tell us anything more about this new record? Because I've been listening to it. It has some great melodies. It's You sing a lot on it. Thank you. I sing every song except one called Let It Loose, which is sung by um, Ellis Hall 
And basically, my brother wrote all the songs. He said, you got to do a new album, like Submarine. I said, Matt, record labels and everything. I don't know. He goes, I'll be the label. He's out with Elton John full time. And he goes, I need a write-off. <laughs> so he's the record label. And he recorded it all, produced it, wrote all the songs, told me what to play, told me what to sing. That's my brother, Matt, my favorite musician and songwriter. I'm best pal. And my sister, Kathy, my best sister, pal, Kathy... <laughs> girl pal um she sang on it my daughter mary my other favorite girl pal uh, sang on it my son noah my other favorite guy pal sang on it it's just so much fun i love the album how is it possible that you have this i mean even even if you're playing on a song like maybe an old david lee roth record or satriani type gig right um you're playing just like you know straight up and down straight beat yet you have, you can tell it's you playing oh, a straight beat. Thank you. I didn't know that. That's news to me. Um, I just love all kinds of music. I love playing straight beats. I love music. Not always just the drums. I just love the songs. So I want to always play for what's, what's right for the song. And if that comes through as being something that's recognizable, you just made my day. Awesome. Well, uh, I guess we can wrap it up. And, uh, you know, thank you for doing this. Carl, thank you for having me on your podcast. Thanks for coming out to my drum camp. Please, everybody, check out Warning Will Robinson, my new CD with my brother Matt. And please check out the Ringo All-Star Tour this summer. It's Ringo, Steve Lukather, Todd Rundgren, Richard Page from Mr. Mr., Greg Raleigh from Santana and Journey, and this guy named Ringo who's in this band called The Beatles. That's my favorite drummer, and I'm playing side-by-side -side with him every night. Thank you, Carl. <laughs>